Ijaz Ahad is a modernist and his philosophy is one of simplicity, functionalism and minimalism and is a combination of German and Japanese modernist ideas. He believes in conscious designs dictated by environmental concerns and the synthesis of region, climate and materials of the time. But he does not believe in a myopic definition of regionalism. He is a great proponent of sustainable development and integrates passive and active sustainability features in all his design. He believes that concrete and stone are the materials suited to the cultural and climatic context of Pakistan and there is much room for exploration in design based on these materials. Ijaz played a leading role in promoting sustainable design development and humanism in architecture in Pakistan. Well, I have a sort of interesting uh, introduction to architecture. I come from a family of architects. Uh, my father, Mr. Muhammad Abdul Ahad, was a very pioneering architect of this, of this country. And uh, he was certainly not just an architect, but he was like a renaissance man to me. And, but I didn't know that. And I did not get into architecture. I, I applied for architecture and then he finally, he said, well, if you can get into the school of Miss van der Rohe, so then I will send you. So luckily I got into the school of Miss van der Rohe and he sent me, uh, sent me abroad. But my love for architecture actually began at the Illinois Institute of Technology where I went because this was the original school of the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus has such an uh, incredible uh, effect even today in all modern architecture. So once I got there, uh, this, this love and affection and the teachers that were there, I have had the privilege of even meeting Mies van der Rohe before he died. So I consider myself very lucky for, for, the, for the beginning to, to happen. And I grew to love architecture. I wasn't born with it. I wasn't, I wasn't there. So somebody can not say, Kabai, you were a born architect. I was not a born architect. I was not a born architect. My father was a born artist, architect, musician, all of that, which I, which I am not. But certainly my love for architecture grew at the Illinois Institute of Technology. And then also, where I worked not only during school with uh, the firm of Skidmore Owings in Merrill. And Skidmore at that time was one of the biggest companies in the world. And they were doing the tallest buildings and whatever. And that's when my love for big things actually grew up. I, I never learned about little houses or, or things like that. But I, I learned about the big things. We worked on, on the Sears Tower, we worked on, uh, uh, well, I came after the John Hancock, but uh, it certainly one met with all the great people of the world. And I was, in fact, very privileged to not have taught, but worked with Dr. Fazur Rahman Khan, the Pakistani engineer who has been awarded Engineer of the Year by World Engineering uh, Council, uh, something that has never happened to any Pakistani. He's a very humble man, and he was on the cutting edge of architecture. And that's where I learned how to build walls upside down, how to build sea walls into the sea. And I've had the privilege of working on three major projects with him. This experience really said, okay, here, you know, you are learning something. So I come from a school that uh, uh, had the last people who did kind of hands-on work. I have, I have done welding, carpentry uh, is, as part of the training, um, many of these things. And I, and I find having the Bauhaus principle, the principles of the Bauhaus ingrained in me uh, through, that, through that process so that they, they inculcated a love uh, for architecture, although they did other things like, like, um, uh, like music and, and dance and product design and whatever. But these, <coughs> these were people that had come in from Germany. Hitler had closed down the Bauhaus. 
you know, there's a very interesting history on the Bauhaus is that it was shut down by Hitler. And all the people that were, that were there went into the United States and other parts of Europe and became great, great people and became the leaders of world architecture. So I had, and they were all kind of, Chicago was one of the basis of, of uh, a lot of architecture. So having gone to school there, having all the architects available within it, this was what actually got me into, into loving the profession. And you know, at that time, we, this thing about sustainability and climate change and all these things wasn't as much as building grand architecture. Corporate architecture is what I grew up into. And when I, when I you know, after that, I, I worked with Skidmore on, on these buildings, with Faz Khan, Bruce Graham. These were people that have led the world, led the world into, into whatever we call today as modern architecture. And I luckily being in the US, I had the opportunity to listen to Louis Kahn and people like, um, you know, all, all the great architects. Uh, I've been to their, to their talks and lectures and sat with them. And that is, that is what builds your education inside you. And so that's my background. And that's uh, from, a, from a very uh, constructivist background. It was, you know, form follows function is something that the Bauhaus always, always used to do. They said, you know, they, they think about less is more. Okay, it's a very deep statement that less is more. Minimalistic architecture. So this, they came after, you know, World War II. They came, uh, 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 all that has an influence on what we have been taught. We came after the war, and they came after the war, and they were building very small little rooms and things like that. That was, that was fine. But we learned how to live with smaller things, and, and how, to, how to build them smaller, how to make them more efficient. And this is, this is the strength that I was armed when I came back uh, to, to Pakistan, and that they tried to keep me back, but I said, no, I have to go back to my, to my country. So I, I, I took, I said, no, you want to come and work with me? You can come and work with me in Pakistan, but uh, I'm on my way back. And, uh, and certainly uh, that's when I came back to, to Pakistan. And, uh, and to me, that was another world uh, compared to what I had been. Well, when I uh, landed back in Pakistan, uh, which was actually by an invitation uh, from a company called, called PPAC, which is similar to NC or NESPAC, uh, and they invited me to head their Karachi office. And so I had a choice whether I would join uh, my own, my own uh, f father's company or would I would I start my own company or would I work for somebody? I had never intended to work for anybody because I'm just an independent sort of a person. But uh, I decided to, to work. And the reason I did that was to prove that I could, I could do, I could perform on my own. And that was the big uh, plus that I think I, I took the right move. And that led me uh, to, to learning on my own. I started to run an office the day I arrived in Pakistan. It was, it was that interesting. And uh, I am very privileged that at the age of 26, I was, I was able to do uh, the, with the master planning, be involved with the master planning of the Pakistan Steel Township, and which was a town of 300,000 people and I work in the master plan and then on phase one of the, of the master plan uh, on it. And I was so lucky that at that young age, I was able to move 40,000 people uh, into the town before I got away uh, onto other, other parts of the work. So this to me was a, was a very big thing. After that, uh, I had a choice again of whether I joined my father or whether I joined my, or had started my own, but I didn't. 
I, I went and joined my father's company and I wanted to take it to the newer heights, the larger heights that uh, already uh, it had attained in its, uh, in its, uh, since its creation. And I wanted to take it further and, and enlighten uh, the, 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 as a tradition, what Ahad Associates uh, became on. So I joined Ahad Associates back in 1977, and since then I have been with the same company. Well, the, uh, the, biggest, uh, the biggest challenge uh, when I came back was that I was used to designing big and tall buildings. I mean, you know, we, we were so spoilt that we would not even touch a building below 35 stories. And, you know, it's just the way we were spoiled. And uh, here when I came back, I said, you don't even, nobody even does. The biggest building was like 22 stories, which was Habib Bank Plaza, which just finished uh, at that point in time. But uh, uh, luckily, uh, my father did the State Bank of Pakistan building in Islamabad, which of course be, you know, came on the 500 rupee note and whatever. So his, his, influence, his influence of Oscar Niemeyer uh, showed a lot into, into that work. And so he had a, a, a great knowledge uh, which, which helped me uh, settle back into, into, into architecture and into life, although I still didn't, wasn't very close to him. But still I was able to, you know, when you have a great person around you, the aura, uh, you get to, it gets inside you, it gets inside you. And you also want to be that great. Of course, I can never be that great, as great as him. But nevertheless, one always tries. After I got into Ahad Associates, I naturally looked for tall buildings. Look for tall buildings. And how did you? How does one get into doing tall buildings when you're a young architect? And uh, so I took part in competitions. I took part in competitions and majority of the, of the few high-rises that I have done uh, all came through a competitive process. And uh, yeah, because that's, that's how you, you move from, from, from one level to another. You know, young architects always keep thinking, okay, how do I get to a bigger work? Well, you get to a bigger work by, by, by working at it. You know, it, it doesn't mean that you do it free, but it did take a competitive process to, to do that. But I've had, I've had uh, a great, I think, uh, uh, been very fortunate to be able, once to do these larger projects, to be able to do it. I, in the 19, around 1985, we had a very good opportunity where Skidmoyings and Merrill uh, and us joined together to do the KPK Agricultural University in Peshawar. Now that was a large, large project and uh, because of my background with the company in Chicago, uh, they, they just simply said, okay, we want to work with you. And that was the best seven years of, of learning with them because this was a company that actually said that we want to do architecture in Pakistan. I mean, basically, not just transfer something done in America and, and, and just bring it here. So they, there was a transfer of technology. They taught our people. Their people came here and taught our people also. So we had a great, uh, great uh, learning curve at that point in time, not just in technology, not just in raising the level of our technology, they, we were introduced by them to the fax hadn't come into Pakistan and we had a fax machine. So things like that, we did big jumps. They were getting into CAD and we were not. We were still drawing by hand. So these kinds of things were helped along by, by, these, uh, by this cooperation that we had. And we did a very successful project it was a 430 acre, it's on 430 acres. 
So you can understand that just to go around the project took a whole bunch of cars just to get around the project. It was, it was that big a project. People don't see, you know, Pakistan, I learned, had, uh, has what we call shopfront architecture. By shopfront architecture, I mean basically people uh, just look at a shopfront, basically an airline office or a bank branch or whatever, and they see that as the, as the architecture. We've always looked at larger issues. So a university campus to us was a very large issue. And how to solve that, how to solve things at a larger scale is something that we learned with the cooperation of, of uh, well-developed foreign uh, architects. And I think uh, uh, that is one of the greatest things is collaboration. I have collaborated with many other architects and we still continue to collaborate with foreign architects. And there is a, there is a marvelous uh, thing that you can look and learn from them. Uh, the one thing that I tried to do in Pakistan when I came back was to do uh, something uh, on the lines of what is called a team effort. That means the individual is not the is not the, the person only. The architect works with a team. Buildings are not that simple anymore, so you work with a team. And I actually promoted a whole team of people to be able to contribute, contribute to any project. So in, in our field, a lot of people thought that they were designing, everybody thought they were designing the building, which was very good. And, and we, we said, great. Uh, Everybody is, has a pride to say that we were part of that design. And I, I try to do that, although the tendency in Pakistan has been to have prima donna architects, you know. I mean, prima donna architects exist very few. You know, Zaha Hadid and, and, and Frank Gehry, these are prima donnas. They exist in their own name. But uh, firms like Skidmore Owings and Merrills and RMGM, they contribute to architecture as a group. And that's what I tried to do here in Pakistan, is to bring a group practice together so that teams can work uh, in unison. I think the question to say, uh, do I do iconic architecture? Um, in the real sense, I really don't. I really don't do iconic architecture. I, uh, iconic architecture, was not the way I was trained. If while doing the design, the, the, icon, the architecture becomes iconic, that's fine. That, that to me is first. Because buildings are, are, have to be functional. Buildings have to, be, have, to, have to work for human beings. They are not like the artist, where he's just expressing himself and doesn't care what everybody else thinks. So that is how we have uh, always approached uh, uh, my, my, my philosophy is every project is taken at its own challenge. Every project. Because they come with their own challenges. Some sites are small, some sites are too big, uh, some sites have to be, have to be uh, uh, worked out uh, uh, in, in a very complex uh, sort of a manner. I mean, if you look at if you look at uh, simple buildings, uh, uh, it's very hard to make things turn simple. We we think that we we do a very complex sort of a thing, and they say, well, can we make it simple? So life has to be has to be made simple so that it works. Another thing I learned a lot in Pakistan is that the construction industry is a very poor industry. And therefore, for us to dream of things that are not constructible became a very important part of my life. Uh, and similarly, because of that, the construction industry has not followed, has not followed uh, the trends in the world. In 45 years, if I give you one example, it's, it's uh, uh, all I have seen in 45 years 
is that cement concrete comes in ready in, in mixing trucks. I mean, that's really not improvement. It, it, the world has gone way beyond what we are. But we are working within our limitations. And, and we certainly need to work harder, both in education and the construction industry needs to have it. Hopefully, when the economy gets better, that we will be able to do uh, a lot more, uh, uh, a lot more better, not just better architecture, but uh, a better quality of building. Uh, to me, uh, the biggest, the biggest reform is, is get, get people more practical. It's uh, today the world is more theoretical. In a, let me, uh, let me explain it this way. In a developed world, the construction industry is very good. So they tell you, Mr. Architect, that you dream of your building and we will build it for you. Here, it's totally reverse. They say, well, Mr. Architect, you dream of the building and you tell me how to screw every, every nail in the head, you will tell me. Because if, if, if it's something goes wrong, you are to blame. So this is, this is something that, that is very, very important to learn in the industry. I remember uh, uh, many years ago when Habib Fidali and I were doing a presentation together. Uh, he was doing it on LUMS and I was doing it on, I think, KPK Agricultural University. And our, our colleague, our American colleague, sat up and said, oh, you know, Pakistani, we find uh, our colleagues at Ahad Associates so good at, at doing details and construction details and whatever. He said, in America, we would not worry about these details. We would spend the same time proportioning a door because we would know, we know that the construction will be right. Not in all the cases, but majority of the cases. And that is what it is. We are still, you must remember, we are still in a craft age. And that's very important. We are not in the information and digital age in architecture. We are still in the craft age. Therefore, we must learn how to do the craft. As, a, as an old professor of mine once said, just learn to do the box right. You have a lifetime to be creative. And that's what I try to do with, uh, with, with, with my work is let's make the building work very well and then let's see how much of an icon can you make. I, I converted from, from what was just buildings to experiencing space. That is, that is how I converted here. Uh, how you experience space is something that does not just come with looks. It comes with walking through a building. It comes with walking through a space uh, and uh, through a project. Uh, if, you, if you look at, uh, for example, um, the KPK Agriculture University, that is very, very radically different than Habib University, uh, which, which is a very small property, uh, you know, compared to, I mean, it's only about six point something acres compared to 430 acres in, in, in Peshawar. So the entire solution had, had to be different. So we, we, we worked, and this is, of course, it's an urban thing. So they all come with their own challenges. So sometimes you, you break away. I mean, the KPK Agricultural University has buildings that are spread, buildings that are spread uh, all over the place uh, where you walk from one building to another. Whereas Habib University is such a complex thing that all the buildings have been integrated together and to, to form because that was their philosophy also. So it has to come with not just your philosophy, but what the client's philosophy is onto what he wants to do with the project. That to me is very, very important. It's, I don't follow a style of architecture at all. I've always said that. All my buildings will look different. 
There may be a few features you can, you can catch here and there which are very successful. So one tends to repeat them. But other than that, uh, every project comes with its own challenges. And we, we have, if you look at our, our um, Gilgit projects, our Gilgit projects had, had elements of remoteness, how far they were from the cities, what materials could be used, who was constructing them. They were constructed by, by the community. They were not constructed by fancy contractors. Yet some of that work is much better than you would do with contractors because they work with a zeal. The Aga Khan projects have uh, come with, with an inspiration from His Highness themselves. And so, so everybody that who works in them does it with a lot of love. So you need love, okay? And as I, as I tell everybody, we, we, have, we have to now uh, worry about how passionate you are in whatever you do, okay? We, we have, I mean, you take a project like Sanofi Aventus. Sanofi Aventus, is, is, a modern, is a modern office building. We went there to do interiors. And we looked at the building and we said, well, you have your interior, but the exteriors look terrible. So they said, oh, really? So we said, okay, can we give you a proposal for it? And we gave them a proposal. And they, they sent that proposal to France and they, and they said, this building cannot be built in Pakistan. This solution cannot be built in Pakistan. So we had a very good client. Here, clients become very important in shaping, in shaping or the success of your buildings. Here, the client said, Mr. Ahad, why don't you go and show them what, what we can do or cannot do? And he said, go ahead and do it. And we did it. And we did it and they, they could not believe it uh, when, when, when the, the, the French people came came around, flew down, and they, they looked at it, and they were, they, were just, they were just amazed. So it's a great feeling. Uh, and, and one of the greatest things you should do in architecture is you must be able to go back to a client, and he must be happy with you. you know, that is a very important thing to do. Uh, a, a very wise partner of Skidmore taught me this thing. He said, he said I'd like to go back to my project 30 years from now and be welcome. They should not, they should not talk, they should talk well of me, not just complain about the project in any, any way. So if you approach your project with that kind of a, of, a, of a passion, then you will make friends that will stay with you for life. And that is what partially what makes architects successful also. So it's not a question of making money. I chose very early in life to say that I would not do, uh, you know, there are two things you can do in, in business. You can either make a business or you have a business oriented uh, profession of architecture, or you can have a profession oriented business, okay? In profession oriented business, you don't make money. In a business oriented profession where you say, crank the thing out, just get the work out and get a volume out, that's where you make money. But in, when you do professional architecture, the satisfaction, that is great. That is un unbeatable. Uh, no amount of money can give you the satisfaction. I think that's a very, uh, it's a very good question. Um, one, when you learn architecture, you just learn the technicalities and the general knowledge and the skill. But as you, as you grow older into architecture or grow more maturely into architecture, you talk about humanism because we are building for human beings after all. And so one must learn to care that did we look after them is the space enjoyable? Not just that it satisfies your ego, but is it enjoyable? Now take a look. As I developed uh, in, in, into my profession, I grew uh, with a love for, for hospital architecture. 
and uh, and hospital architecture is a, is very tough architecture and to me uh, all the challenges you know younger architects are very good at doing smaller smaller works and and very creative in their things but to me i have to have a challenge and one of the greatest challenges that we had uh, we did many hospitals we did a lot of buildings at the aga khan uh, university hospital uh, and some other hospitals in, in quite a lot of hospitals in fact uh, around the country but uh, i am now uh, involved with uh, with Lyakat National Hospital which has become very close to my heart it has become close because it was a hospital it was an old hospital and it, again it had just scattered buildings all over the place with cars and cars and people all mixing mixing up so i said ke okay, let's make the hum let's bring humanism into into this into this project uh, we took the cars out of the majority of the areas uh, and so that patients could have patients were able to come out into into good green spaces uh, to us that they were happy you could see happier faces and to me that's the humanism that must enter into all architecture any vidhi who does anything is just not necessarily a wow but it's a comfort zone one must feel comfortable and all of that depends on lighting how you do in the daytime how you do it in the in the night time how you carry people through spaces uh, all of that is you're caring for the human being so to me that's the humanism i now want to add which i have done uh, at liaquat and i continue to do so as we proceed with the uh, uh, total remodeling of 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 the of the hospital and while doing that we are also we are also looking at uh, at uh, buildings within it uh, that will need to go grow with with the hospital and have a have a have a still have a very lively uh, feeling so we are trying to convert a 50s hospital into something uh, something uh, in the 21st century and uh, while it while it is still a non, not uh, not for profit hospital yet our our uh, approach is to use good materials so that everything is looked at in the manner of an institution you know offices and things you can do and and in 5 years you want to redo things again but in hospitals they have to work for a longer time and people patient and in fact in hospitals people uh, is different people every day it's not the same people and they must come and feel comfortable in the hospital to me that is half the half the repair of your health so healthcare me humanism really comes in and i am trying to give my contribution to uh, uh, to that cause uh, at at the liaquat national hospital we've done many many things on the engineering side we've done many things on the architectural side but and on the on the landscaping side and people are appreciating i mean if you see the 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 dhaba which we call baithak over there uh, you don't just get patients but you get you get you know romantic couples coming and 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 spending time there so you know you're not afraid of a hospital because it's a very friendly hospital and that is what i want to bring into my into my work continue to bring into my work as a, as i grow into the profession you know you talk about uh, old o- old people or or senior architects you know architects them have most architects in the world have never been successful before just around 60 or so that old they are that old before they do anything that is famous for it and you know you you, you can't be like a stock broker you cannot become uh, rich uh, at the age of 25 or 28 uh, 
and, and, and then, then forget about it. Architects have to work at their profession. We, we had the opportunity uh, at the Liaquat National Hospital uh, to do a mosque. Uh, and this mosque was the idea of the, of the managing um, uh, medical director uh, who, who had some inspiration because of his father had donated a mosque somewhere and he wanted to do this here. And the idea was that we would make it into something that will, because it's for everybody, right? Anybody who comes to the hospital. And people who require prayers, who require solace, they all need a place to go to. So the, the mosque was designed not just as a place to come and pray five times a day, but as a place to come back to, uh, as a place of solace, as a place of prayer, for, for when, the, when the visitors uh, pray for their patients. So to us, that was. Then comes, of course, the architecture of the space. So in the architecture of the space, we, we tried to use a very, very earthy, earthy finish on it. And, and uh, you, you can see that. And everything, it, it was not a very high budget, uh, by high budget building at all. And one of the greatest things that we thought when we did very a great innovation was uh, we took away the, the the carpeting of the carpeting of the mosque uh, uh, away yeah, because to us that was kind of unhygienic. So we put in uh, sports flooring, and that did two things: it kept the floor very clean. And it also gave very nice softness to the knees when people were praying. And is now that this trend has caught on so much that everybody around Pakistan is calling us to say, okay, please tell us how to do this. You know, whether we do it. So we, we just pass around the information. We have a policy. We don't want to take anything to the grave. Everything is shareable with everybody. So, but this mask has uh, some features that one needs to look at. Uh, it has a grand space in it, the feeling of a grand space. It, it, it doesn't have too many people, but about 1,500 people can be accommodated there. But it's, we are hoping that 25 years from now, 30 years from now, that place will look as good and in fact mature into a thing rather than requiring something that requires paint and this and that all the time. It's a permanent finished uh, space and we hope, uh, and, and it's, it's become very successful. People from all over, in fact even from outside countries have come in just to look at the mosque and, and, have, and have appreciated it. So it's a great feeling sometimes that you, you are lucky to, to be able to do it. And of course, the client must give you the opportunity. Many architects go through an entire lifetime, but they don't get an opportunity, so they cannot show their work. And here, in a small way, we were able to show what we did. So this is a great feeling that we go back to your work and people have appreciated. I am satisfied uh, with neither the a state of education and architecture, nor, nor the state of the construction industry. At the present time, I've been back about 45 years into this country, and I find, and I find very little has changed. So uh, both on, in architectural education, we still, our schools have still not developed. We still are only working on, on trying to do skills we have a very confused nature. And I do not blame our students. Our students are very bright students. They are, they're as good as, as any of the kids around the world. Uh, but, but it is to me, uh, we need to teach our faculties uh, better, train our faculties better to, to make the next generation of architects uh, have any, any real meaning in their work. Right now, they are seeing a lot of finished work and they think somebody is going to just 
just get it done. It is still the approach because the hands-on approach has gone. It's all become social. And so this is something that this country needs to look at. We are not a developed nation. The younger generation of architects is, in a sense, quite disappointing. The exceptions are always exceptions, but they're generally very young. The reason, the reason for that is that given the information age, we have so much information available, but we are not doing our research. We're not doing search. Forget about research. We're not doing search. And, and if we go, even on the internet, you're able to find so many things. And we are not doing that. So the, the schooling, pro so this has to start in the schooling process where you should learn to question things. And, and when by the time you come into architecture, you should be able to question. That is what is missing uh, in, in, in the younger kids, is asking questions. They just want solutions. They give me the answer to this, you know. Why it happens, nobody wants to know. And to me, uh, the other thing that is very important for young professionals is, is to have passion. You have to do architecture with passion. If you don't have the passion, get out of it. Get out of it. There's a lot of other things in the world you can do today. But if you want to do architecture, you must be passionate. And this is my greatest advice to the young. They're looking for shortcuts. You're very right. They're, they're looking for shortcuts because this is the world of shortcuts. And, but somehow creativity does not come with shortcuts. Creativity requires you to go through the process. And once you go through the process, you, the solution that you get is a more wise solution. Thinking is what we have to teach everyone.